I had been working at the Greywood National Park for ten years. I loved my job and the serenity that the park offered. The sound of birds whispering and chirping about their day filled my head as I watched the sun rise over the mountains and turn the pink clouds into a brilliant orange. Also, I knew every inch of the park like the back of my hand. As a park ranger, I've seen and heard a lot of strange things over the years. Some of them are hard to explain, and others are downright spooky. But it's all part of the job, and I've learned to take it in stride. One of the strangest stories I've heard happened a few years ago. A group of hikers had gone missing in the woods, and we launched a massive search and rescue operation. We combed the forest for days, but we couldn't find any trace of them. It was like they had vanished into thin air. Then, a week later, one of the hikers stumbled out of the woods. He was disoriented and confused, and he kept muttering about how the forest had swallowed them up. We took him to the hospital, and he eventually recovered, but he never spoke about what had happened in the woods. Another odd occurrence happened when a group of campers reported seeing strange lights in the sky. They described them as bright orbs that seemed to move in a pattern. We investigated, but we couldn't find any evidence of a UFO or anything like that. But the campers were so convinced that they had seen something otherworldly that they refused to stay in the park any longer. However, there was one area that I always avoided. The whispering woods, a dense and dark part of the forest where people claimed to hear strange whispers at night. It was a patch of forest where the trees grew close together and tangled branches blocked out most of the light from the moon. The canopy was so thick that it housed a complete layer of epiphytes, plants, that grow in trees but never touch the ground. In some places, hanging vines stretched from tree to tree and gave a glimpse through the treetops like ropes holding an invisible net up high. I hated to think about what might be lurking in the dark there. Some said it was ghost whispering, while others said it was the restless spirits of trees that had been felled in a great storm many years ago. Whatever the case, I never went near it. One day I was on my routine patrol in the drizzly, foggy forest. The musty scent of old leaves and damp soil leaked into the air as I brushed past the nameless trees. A low droning grew louder, and I spotted a silhouette through the mist. It took me several moments to adjust my vision and make out that it was an elk. Suddenly I came across a group of terrified hikers. They were huddled together. Their faces were pale and their eyes wide with fear. They were trembling and clutching at each other, their bodies tense and braced as if expecting an attack. Their clothes were disheveled and streaked with dirt and sweat, and their breathing was shallow and rapid. They claimed that they had ventured into the whispering woods and had heard eerie voices, urging them to go deeper into the forest. The hikers had barely made it out, and their pale faces were enough for me to take their claims seriously. Officer, thank goodness you're here. We heard these strange voices in the woods, and we don't know what to do, he said, his voice quivering with fear. I nodded, trying to calm them down. Can you tell me more about the voices you heard? Another hiker, a woman with short, curly hair, spoke up. They were like whispers, you know, but they were so clear, and they seemed to be coming from all around us. We couldn't understand what they were saying, but it was like they were urging us to go deeper into the woods. I frowned, taking mental notes. Did you see anything unusual in the forest? The hikers shook their heads in unison. No, nothing. But the trees seemed to be closing in on us, and we felt like we were being watched said another hiker, a young man with a backpack. I scanned the area looking for any signs of danger. All right, just follow the path and leave the woods for now, I said, and the group did so. As the sun began to set, I decided to investigate the woods and put an end to this mystery. I ventured into the forest with a flashlight and walkie, talkie in hand. The sun's light peeked through the canopy of trees, barely touching the ground and leaving everything in a deep shade. The shadows stretched out like tendrils, reaching into the distance. Mist loomed in the air, making the trees seem bigger and more imposing. The wind picked up, howling softly and rustling the leaves of the trees as if beckoning me forward. A strange stillness hung in the air as if something hidden 
waited in the shadows. In the distance, I heard faint whispers, barely audible on the wind. As I was getting deeper, the air became colder, and I tried to ignore the chill that ran down my spine. Then I stopped in the middle of a small clearing and started to listen. The place was bathed in a deep and eerie darkness, the moonlight filtering in through the canopy of trees. The shadows of the trees stretched out like tendrils, reaching deep into the darkness. The mist loomed in the air, making the trees seem bigger and more imposing. The ground was damp and muddy, littered with pine needles and fallen branches. A hush crept through the night air, interrupted only by the soft chirping of crickets and the occasional croak of a frog. The breeze rustled through the leaves of the surrounding trees, and an owl hooted in the distance. Then I started hearing them, but they did not come from the forest. They were in my head. They were low, almost inaudible, yet highly unsettling. It's as if a thousand tiny voices were speaking at once, but all at once. Every syllable was whispered in an otherworldly tongue, full of unknown sounds and unfamiliar syllables. It felt like a cacophony of unearthly sounds that reverberated through my mind. Then I could make out a sentence, go away. As I stood there, the ominous tone of the word sent an immediate shiver down my spine. It felt like someone or something was warning me of an impending danger, and my mind quickly processed the potential risks of staying in the area any longer. Without a moment's hesitation, I turned on my heels and ran away, out from the forest. Adrenaline coursed through my veins, fueling my quick escape as every step felt like a matter of life or death. I could sense the presence of an unseen danger lurking in the shadows, and my heart raced with every passing moment. The dense underbrush and tangled branches seemed to conspire against me, but I pushed on, fighting my way through the obstacles in my path. My breathing became ragged, and my heart beat faster and louder as I ran for my life. Finally, I emerged from the forest, gasping for breath, and I realized that my whole body was trembling with fear. The warning had been too intense to ignore, and I was grateful that I had heeded it. I took a moment to collect myself and to calm my racing thoughts, trying to make sense of what had just happened in the depths of the foreboding forest. What the hell was it? I muttered to myself in the comforting safety of my car while driving home twenty miles away. When I returned home, no matter how hard I tried, the memory of the foreboding whispers still lingered in my mind. Those voices were enough to keep me awake late into the night. My thoughts filled with dread and confusion as to what had happened in the forest. I decided to research the area in an effort to uncover the source of the mysterious whispers. I scoured historic records and digital newspaper clippings, hoping to find some evidence of what could have been lurking in that forest. What I found were only reports of people hearing the whispers. Also, I did find news articles with evidence of disappearances and strange sightings, but I was not sure if they were relevant or not. The thing is, those reports were from different parts of the forest each year. I was looking for a pattern, but there was nothing that could explain what had caused those whispers. Although I didn't discover any conclusive explanation for the phenomenon I heard in the forest that night, I could say with certainty that there was something strange lurking beneath its surface. I did not understand it yet. The next day I was so scared that I called in sick to work. I needed a rest to put myself together and process the events of the previous night. I looked out of the window. The sky was a deep shade of gray, with heavy clouds that blotted out the sun and concealed any hint of blue in their shadows. Rain poured down in sheets, puddles forming in low-lying areas and overlawing into the streets. The world outside was blurry and distorted, an endless landscape of gray and mist. The rain tapped heavily outside like a symphony of drums, creating a mesmerizing rhythm. The windows were blurred with droplets, creating a static soundtrack from the raindrops hitting the glass. The wind whipped through the trees, and the thunder rumbled like waves crashing against the shore, and the lightning flashed briefly like an explosion of light. I reclined on my couch and listened to the raindrops, but a few minutes later, I turned on the television. Soon, a report about a forest came up as the news of the day. 
Huge rocks, trees, and debris were strewn across the land. The force of the landslide had upturned the entire terrain, leaving a mangled mess that stretched for miles. Heavy boulders have come crashing down from the mountain, and there is destruction everywhere. Huge cracks had formed in the ground, and deep ravines had been created as far as the eye could see. Pools of muddy water reflected the dull sky, and a thick haze hung in the air. Then I realized it was the forest where I had been working for years. The forest was completely destroyed by a landslide. Good morning. We begin this morning with a breaking news story. A massive landslide has struck Greywood National Park, causing extensive damage and destruction. The reporter said, People were walking around, carrying equipment and searching for survivors. The landslide occurred early this morning, and it has completely destroyed the park. There are no reported fatalities at this time, but many people are missing. The cause of the landslide is currently unknown, but officials say that recent heavy rainfall may have played a role. The park was a popular destination for hikers, nature enthusiasts, and tourists. It is estimated that millions of dollars in damage have been done to the park's infrastructure and facilities. This is a tragedy. The National Park Forest was a place of natural beauty, and now it's gone. I can't believe it, a local resident said to the reporter. Recovery efforts are underway, and emergency services are on the scene. However, the park is expected to remain closed for an indefinite period. Our thoughts are with those who have been affected by this disaster. The reporter finished his news report. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, and my jaw hung open in disbelief. Suddenly, everything clicked into place. The whispers were not meant to cause harm. They had been trying to warn us all this time. The forest seemed to know its death was coming. It was close to three in the afternoon when the knock came on the door to the ranger station. I was mildly surprised to hear it, given that it was early January in the foothills of the Adirondacks, a temperature was hovering at a balmy 12 degrees, with wind chills driving it into the negatives with frustrating frequency. The wind had been howling against the isolated station since before sunrise that morning, and I wondered if I was going to need to deal with any damage to my little abode after the storm blew through. I'd been monitoring the forecast and weather radar all day, and it looked like I was in for quite the blizzard by the time evening rolled around. It had been snowing most of the day already, but so far it hadn't been very heavy. I expected that to change by nightfall, however, which in January was only in another couple hours. I didn't usually keep the front door to the ranger station locked since it wasn't uncommon for hikers and campers to make a pit stop on their way up the trail to the observation areas, either to log their camping site for the night or just in hopes of a nice hot cup of coffee before they continued on their hike. The door hadn't been latching correctly lately, though, and had the tendency to swing open when a strong gust caught it just right so I'd been keeping it locked until I could repair it. The knocking was light, somehow hesitant and almost polite, if that makes any sense. It was so quiet that I almost didn't hear it over the whistling of the wind and creaking of the station. I'd been in the middle of composing an email request for a new generator, as mine had been acting up a bit lately, and had to pause my typing and listen intently to ensure I'd even heard it in the first place. When it came again, only a bit louder, I pushed back from my desk and took another sip from my steaming mug before walking over and opening the door. Outside stood five people, three men and two women, all dressed in what looked like expensive and very new cold-weather coats and snow pants, all looking very similar except for the various bright colors and all bearing the familiar North Face logo. Their anxious faces peeked out from within their drawn and cinched hoods, and I had to suppress a grin. They looked dressed to climb Everest, not hike the lower trails of the Adirondacks. Tourists, probably European, and probably their first time seeing this sort of weather, I thought. It was a fairly common occurrence. 
folks from all over the world came to visit these mountains, looking to experience all the beautiful wilderness we had to offer. I wasn't unsympathetic. If you weren't used to the unpredictable climate here in the winter, it could quickly catch you by surprise and get dangerous very quickly. Hi there, I said cheerfully, stepping back into the doorway and motioning them inside. Come in out of the snow and warm up by the fire. The man who'd been knocking turned to his companion, said something in Spanish, and then turned back to me with a wide grin and nodded, stepping past me and into the warmth of the station. The rest followed quickly, anxious to get out of the chill wind that was blowing hard outside. As soon as they were all in, I closed the door again and locked it to make sure it didn't blow open. Gracious, sir, I am Martin, said the man, pulling back his hood and unzipping his quilted down coat. He gestured to the others in turn. This is Lucas, Diego, Sophia, and Triana. I nodded my greeting to each. Martin continued with a smile. It is very cold. We come to visit United State of America from Spain to see your beautiful mountains and enjoy the lovely scenery. His accent was very heavy, but his English was far better than my Spanish, so I didn't have much room to criticize. But it seems a storm is coming, and we fear there will be too much snow. Unfortunately, we are not so prepared for that. I nodded, patting him on the shoulder as I moved past him and opened the door leading to the shelter room, reaching in and turning on the lights. That's certainly true, my friend. I'm afraid we're in for a bit of a blizzard this evening. Bad time for a winter stroll through the mountains, I said. Fortunately, we happen to have enough space for you and your friends to make yourself at home and wait out the storm. My name is Jackson Turner, Ranger. There's coffee over there on the table and bunks and a comfortable sitting area in here. When a group just stared at me blankly for a moment, I got the feeling I'd lost most of them somewhere along the way. Instead, I just offered the friendliest smile I had and gestured to the room. At that, they all grinned and nodded their thanks as they quickly shuffled past me, dropping their packs on various bunks and beginning to remove their cold weather gear. I made sure they all got something hot to drink and that they understood they were welcome to stay until the weather had cleared before returning to my desk. They all seemed very pleasant and grateful for my assistance, and they drifted from my thoughts as I continued my administrative work. It was another hour before the second knocking rapped at the door, this one slow and oddly arrhythmic, almost a staccato beat, somehow unsteady and not as tentative as my other guests had been. I sighed heavily and straightened, heading around the counter and back over to the door. I hadn't had any visitors to the ranger station in a week or more, and now they were pouring in like this was a holiday in express or something. I unlocked the door and pulled it open, putting on my official greeting smile once again. In the doorway, shoulders and hooded head covered in a layer of icy snow was a man of roughly my height, about six foot or so. Unlike the others, he wasn't dressed in fancy, color-coordinated cold weather gear, but instead wore a mismatched combination of clothes, like he had raided the bargain bin at a second-hand expedition store. His pants were a blue quilted nylon and looked more on the expensive side, even if they didn't exactly fit him very well. But his coat was fur-lined and looked like it was made of padded wool, layered over an old fleece jacket. His boots looked newer and not too warm, something more suited to a summer hike than a winter in the mountains, I thought. Hey there, I said as warmly as I could, waving him inside. Come on in out of the snow. He didn't say anything, but gave the slightest hint of a nod as he walked past me. The strong scent of musky body odor followed him, and I wondered if he was one of those reclusive hermits that I'd heard rumors of, living out here all by himself in some makeshift shack. I closed the door and locked it again, turning back to the man. He'd already taken note of the bunk room to the left, where the Spaniards were getting settled, and he headed on and sat on one of the empty bunks in the back corner of the room. He didn't remove his coat or offer any greeting to the others, and I noted with some curiosity that he didn't have any sort of pack with him, which further made me wonder if he lived nearby in some off-grid cabin. 
I could see that the others were smiling and making pleasantries towards him, but he just sat there, dark eyes quietly watching the activity without a single word. There was the slightest hint of a smile upon his lips, incongruous and somehow unnerving. It only took them a few moments to abandon their attempts at including him in conversation and turn back to their own group, speaking quietly in Spanish amongst themselves. For a moment I wondered if he might be in some sort of shock. The temperature was dropping pretty quickly outside, and it had already been too cold for some of the clothing he wore. I considered giving him a quick once, over to make sure he didn't have any frostbite or signs of hypothermia, but something about him told me he might not be so welcoming to my attention. I stood there in the doorway to the bunk room for a minute, looking over the scene. Something about the newcomer seemed off somehow. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but the way he moved, his lack of communication, the way he was just sitting there perfectly still on the corner bunk just seemed strange. There was something else, too, something that I couldn't quite put my finger on, something that tickled the back of my consciousness, just out of reach, more an instinctive unease than coherent thought. I found myself hoping the man would spend a few minutes warming himself and then be on his way again. Turning my attention to the others, I realized that they must have found something odd with him as well. They had all subconsciously clustered around the end of the table farthest from him and were speaking more quietly than before, more subdued. I noticed them periodically casting quick, uncomfortable glances in his direction, but never for more than the briefest of moments, as if they were just reassuring themselves that he hadn't moved and was still sitting there. I also noticed curiously that none of them sat with their back to the man, likely also subconsciously. I was just about to walk over and talk to him to shake the odd feeling away when Martin appeared in front of me, his brow furrowed. Sir, my friends and I are worried about the other campers, he said. This drew my attention. There weren't any campers registered to be out here today. Was the newcomer one of them? Maybe they were in trouble. What campers? I asked with a frown. He motioned vaguely to the north. We passed their campsite on our way to the observation point before the weather turned us back here, maybe a half kilometer up the trail in a clearing beside a small brook. He cast a quick look over his shoulder at the stranger sitting in the corner. There it was again, I thought that same unease. Martin continued. There were three of them, two men and a woman. They had some of those cold weather tents set up and seemed to be well prepared for the storm, at least as far as we could tell. We stopped and warmed ourselves by their fire for a bit. They seemed very experienced and were not concerned about the cold, but I'm no expert. Well, it sounds like they should be okay. I said with the best reassuring smile I could muster. They should have checked in with me, but if they're as prepared as you think, I'm sure they'll be just fine. When a storm passes, I'll head up there and check on them, just to make sure. He flicked his eyes to the man again, and then locked them with mine with a surprising intensity, like he was trying to tell me something with his gaze alone. He lowered his voice and said, The campers... They were all wearing very good clothing. Sophia's brother is a climber in some very cold regions, and she recognized the camper's gear is similar to what he uses. Even better news, them. I started, but Martin cut me off. Exactly like the pants that man is wearing now, he said quietly. I looked over at the man again, once again taking note of his hodgepodge combination of clothing. The gloves he still wore looked to be thin and ill-suited to the winter weather, but looked well, made, and would have been fine for a mild autumn outing. He still hadn't moved or said anything, and his emotionless eyes drifted slowly across the Spaniards with what seemed to my growing paranoia like a hungry interest. It was almost like he was inventorying them, evaluating them, somehow. Once again, that tickle in the back of my brain, telling me something was not quite right with a man. Something was just a little out of place, but I still couldn't figure it out. It set my teeth on edge. I looked back at Martin. Are you sure? He shrugged. As sure as we can be. 
Sophia says she is certain, but the rest of us do not have the experience to recognize these details. As well as her, was this man with them? I asked, but I already knew the answer. Martin shook his head. No, I have never seen him before now. He leaned in a little closer and lowered his voice. This man, there is something, he said, trailing off, unable to find the right words. I nodded. I know. I feel it, too. I walked back to my desk and opened a drawer, retrieving the holstered handgun and attaching it to my belt. The spare magazine went into my pocket, and I grabbed my heavy jacket from a nearby hook and pulled my fur-lined hat over my ears. Martin followed me, watching with interest. I looked over his shoulder, making sure we were out of sight and earshot of the bunk room. I'm going to check on the camp. Have you ever handled a shotgun? I asked. He nodded. I hunt pheasant with my cousins every year. I am a very good shot. Good, I said. That doorway beside my desk is my room. Right inside you'll find a 12-gauge pump, loaded but not chambered. If you need it, he just gave a silent duck of his head. I should be back within the hour. I know the place you're talking about. Keep him here until I return. But don't do anything if you don't have to, I said, closing my coat and making sure the zippered slit covering my holster was open and accessible. Be careful, Jackson Turner. I feel some darkness in the air. I just gave a tight-lipped nod before opening the door and stepping out into the wind. The icy chill hit me immediately, cutting through my heavy pants and finding its way through every little opening in my clothing. The wind out here was a constant buffeting and howled in my ears. The snow along the trail was only a little over ankle, deep but tugged at my boots with every step, slowing my progress. The area that Martin had described was one of the few marked campsites along this area of the trail, and though it wasn't strictly required for campers to check in before setting up, it was highly encouraged. This deep in the woods, twenty miles away from the nearest town, the only real lifeline that anyone had were the rangers. If anything went wrong out here, the fact that you registered with a local ranger station may very well mean the difference between life and death. That didn't mean that everyone followed that rule, though. Most of the time it was new campers, those folks lacking some of the wisdom of experience, that didn't know or didn't think it necessary to check in before setting camp. Sometimes it was the opposite. Some highly experienced outdoors folks felt that there was no need, that they could handle anything that came their way. Either way, as I followed that northern trail, a growing unease began to color my steps. I felt the tight grip of anxiousness tickling my every breath. I didn't know what I was going to find. If I was lucky, I'd find three cold weather, double wall silicone, nylon tents, with their occupants snuggled warmly and safely within. If that was the case, I'd just check on them and turn back to my station, hopefully before the worst of the storm began in earnest. If not, well, I'd have to figure that out when it came. A half hour later, I reached the campsite, or at least what was left of it. The remains of what were obviously three high-quality winter tents were positioned compactly around a central fire pit, their bright red materials shredded and torn and flapping violently in the fierce wind, looking very much like a lunatic array of flags in the heart of a hurricane. I pulled the ears of my hat lower, adjusting the chin strap tighter. Hello, I shouted, straining to make my voice carry above the wind. Even with all my force, it still sounded pathetically impotent in the roar of the coming storm. Is anyone here? I waited a long moment, but could hear nothing but the rush of wind and the whip-like snapping of the nylon fabric. The campsite had all the hallmarks of a bear attack. Except I hadn't seen a bear in months, and we'd never had a bear attack in this area that I'd ever heard of. It wasn't like the forests out west. We didn't have brown bears here. Black bears, yeah, but they were smaller and nowhere near as aggressive as big browns. Sure, they could be dangerous, especially if startled or threatened, but they didn't actively hunt humans. I took a few more steps forward into the campsite, drawing the SIGSAR 10mm, 
and holding it at low, ready as I performed a quick visual of the tents. Nothing. No signs of bodies, blood, a struggle, anything at all. Just destroyed tents that could have been abandoned by the campers when the wind started getting bad and the fabric started to fail. And then it caught my eye, a flash of dark gray partially hidden by the snow between two of the tents. Another ten minutes of snowfall, and I'd have never seen it. Moving closer, I towed the frozen bundle of cloth, overturning it before picking it up with my free hand, keeping the sag at the ready. It was a pair of thick winter pants, old and torn, and covered in dark red-brown stains that looked too fresh for my comfort. They were fur-lined and looked to be woolen. As soon as I lifted them free of the snow, the wind blew a familiar musky smell into my face, and I dropped them in revulsion. Another two feet beyond, the hint of blue and the white drift drew my attention, and I cautiously approached. I recognized the puffy material of a cold weather jacket, and when I reached out to expose more of it, I staggered backwards in shock, realizing suddenly that I was looking at a crudely dismembered arm. Still wrapped snugly in its warm jacket sleeve, I cursed aloud and stumbled backwards, tripping over the stones surrounding the fire pit and falling hard on my ass, eyes wide and not even registering the pain of my tailbone meeting the frozen ground. I sat there hyperventilating for what felt like minutes, long enough that the frigid chill was settling into my legs and backside from where I sat dumbly in the snow, eyes wide and breath ragged. It was only when my arms began to shake that I realized I was gripping the handgun as tightly as I could, aimed insanely at the gray mass of frozen trousers on the ground before me, as if they were going to suddenly spring to life and attack. Shit! was all I could think to say as rationality suddenly returned, clearing the pulsating red spots from my vision and slamming my thoughts back to the present jarringly. The pounding in my ears began to lessen, replaced once again with the unrelenting wail of the wind. I leapt to my feet and started running back along the trail, back to my station where Martin and Lucas and Diego and Sophia and the other girl, whose name I couldn't remember, sheltered from the coming storm with. With what? Was he some sort of psycho serial killer, stalking the lonely hiking trails of upstate New York? That didn't make any sense. I'd been here for three years and never heard of anything like this. As I ran clumsily through the snow, which was now halfway up my shin, I thought back to those gray pants, discarded in the campsite. They had been shredded, not just torn and ripped from age and wear. It had been something violent that caused the damage, and the blood stains seemed to lend credence to that theory. So whatever had happened, the stranger had decided to replace his damaged and stained pants with what? Those of his victims. And then I thought about how none of his clothes matched, and how his boots and gloves weren't even suitable for winter weather. How long had this been going on? Twenty minutes later, the dim yellow lights from the windows of my station appeared suddenly from the nearly white-out conditions that had overtaken me with the full coming of the storm. The temperature had dropped even more, and I was amazed that I had been able to keep up my pace long enough to make it back, driven by adrenaline and fear. I slowed to a halt before my ranger station, noticing immediately how the front door hung open a few inches. My mind urged me forward to go racing in, but I had to take a few moments to catch my breath and let my racing heart slow a bit before I entered. I couldn't understand why the door was only open a few finger widths. If it hadn't been locked, the first strong gust of wind would have blown it fully open and sent it banging against the wood paneling of the wall behind it. But what occupied my thoughts far more was the implication of that open door. There's no way it could have been missed by anyone within, and nobody in their right mind would have sat in the station while the freezing wind and snow blew in through the open doorway. I pushed that though aside and crept as quietly as possible to the door, pushing it gently at first, then with greater force as I felt some resistance holding it closed. I gripped my sidearm tightly, muzzled directly forward and at chest level, finger resting along the frame of the pistol and ready to drop to the trigger and go to work in a moment's notice. 
The door gradually gave way and pushed inward far enough that I was able to slide through the gap, the howling of the wind and the protesting of the building blessedly providing enough cacophony to cover the sounds of my entrance. As soon as I stepped inside, I found myself in the center of a fever, nightmare. A body lay behind the door and had served as an impromptu barricade. I could only tell that it was one of the women by the delicate shape of the body. The lights in that room were flickering chaotically, the hanging bulb in the center of the room swinging maniacally, as if it had been recently struck and was still settling its pendulum motion. As quietly as I could, I ducked around the doorway into the room, fresh shock coursing through my body in a cold wash that threatened my consciousness. Bodies and pieces of bodies lay strewn about the room haphazardly, most still enshrouded in bits of clothing, now tacked in place by sticky crimson. I could feel the heat in the room from whatever horrifying act of violence had occurred, from the bodies that now lay scattered about like discarded plaything. At my feet I noted a handful of empty shotgun shells where they had fallen and been arrested by the viscous gore that painted the wooden floorboards. The shotgun lay nearby a chamber open and magazine tube empty, only inches away from the barely recognizable remains of the man I'd known as Martin. Terrible slashes and wounds covered his ravaged corpse, looking as if he'd been thrown into a shredder. His limbs were outstretched and only attached by the yellowish tendons and pink muscles, which now lay open and exposed. My eyes were drawn at that moment to the source of the sounds I had heard before, and I saw the crouched form of the stranger straddling one of the bodies, Lucas, I think, by the bright yellow of his North Face jacket. I watched in horror as the stranger dipped his head again and again, jerking it savagely each time it came away, as if tearing away more bits of meat with each movement. I noticed then that the stranger's hands had somehow grown, elongated, and taken on a shiny, chitinous appearance that left the fingers as jagged and gore, encrusted claws. After only a moment's shocked hesitation, my reflexes took over and I snapped the muzzle of my handgun up and squeezed the trigger. I know that the thunderous blasts of the Tim Mum must have been deafening, but I barely registered it as I watched blackened holes appear in the thing's back. It threw its head back in what I can only hope was pain and cried out in a shrieking screech that drowned out all else. I squeezed the trigger again, and another bullet punched its way through the horrifying thing. Suddenly, almost faster than I could track, the stranger exploded up from where it had been feasting and lit upon the wall, its terrible claws sinking into the wood and holding it in place as it turned its head 180 degrees to face me. The eyes had turned completely black and grown to the size of golf balls, and the jaw looked almost to have disjointed from its skull, the skin at the corners of its mouth drawn back in a hideous grin that stretched nearly from ear to ear exposing a mouth full of shark-like triangular teeth, now stained bright red. It tensed, and an instant later it had leapt to the next wall, gripping the exposed wood like some monstrous insect, eyes fixed upon me. Before it could make another move, I fired again and again and again, my panic-induced attack miraculously finding purchase more often than not as empty brass cases ejected against the door frame next to me, ringing out like death bells. Then there was a long moment of silent stillness in the room, and its black eyes were fixed on me, still unnervingly cold and alien. I tensed, waiting for the thing to pounce towards me. But it was clear I'd heard it. I don't know how badly, but black ichor dripped from the half-dozen wounds punched by my hollow points, and I thought I heard a sickly rattling in its slow, deep breath. With a final ear-splitting, otherworldly shriek, it leapt again, this time away from me and through the window at the rear of the room. The glass shattered outward, and then it was over. I stood alone in this charnel house, left only with the remains of the five Spanish tourists, and the disconcerting awareness that the slide of my handgun was locked back, smoke lazily drifting from the barrel, and the magazine now empty. That was almost a year ago, and I've since transferred from field operations 
to an administrative position within the Park Service. My office is located in the middle of a city, surrounded by people and without a lonely forest or dark wilderness in sight. After the investigation died down and the deaths were ruled as animal predation, I tried to return to my posting, but I just couldn't do it. They tore down the old station and built a new one closer to the trailhead, and I thought I could get past it, but I kept seeing that stranger, that creature, every time I closed my eyes. A few times in the dark stillness of the night, I thought I could hear that banshee wail echoing in the distance. Once or twice, I think I heard more than one. I slept with my handgun on the nightstand and the shotgun propped next to my bed and kept the doors locked at all times. I couldn't shake the feeling that it was still out there. Maybe searching for me. Maybe it needed to make sure that I wasn't able to tell anyone about it. You see, in the time since that horrible night, I've scoured the Internet for any possible explanation for what I saw. I consulted any self-proclaimed cryptozoologist or paranormal investigator that would speak to me, but nobody had any rational explanations beyond fairy tales and urban legends, and invariably I was left with as many questions as I started with. And then I tripped across an article one day that changed everything for me. It was a piece written about something called the Uncanny Valley, an idea put forth by some Japanese roboticist. Back in the 70s, at first I almost passed it over, since it seemed mostly to relate to robots and computer graphics, and how people feel increasingly uncomfortable the more realistically human they appear. But then I read a theory about why people may react this way, and how it may be an evolutionary artifact left over in the dark corners of our reptilian brains, about how, at some point in our distant shared racial history, there may have actually been predators that looked almost human. They may have appeared so close to our ancestors that they were able to blend in with us almost perfectly. According to the theory, primitive humans may have developed a keen sense of facial recognition. As a survival mechanism, this may have been passed down through genetic memories, fading just a little with each generation until today, where it existed as little more than an instinctive warning when we looked at someone who wasn't quite right. Someone who seemed almost normal, but perhaps with the slightest of imperfections that made them seem just a little wrong. Someone that our instincts told us didn't belong. Someone who wasn't really one of us at all. I wondered if these things have been with us all along, hiding among us, stalking us from within our own numbers. Yesterday, on my commute to the office, I noticed a young woman sitting by herself in the back of the subway car. Even though it was crowded, the seats beside her were empty, and I noticed that the other commuters almost seemed to be avoiding getting too close to her. I don't think anyone really realized it, but people kept glancing uneasily at her out of the corners of their eyes. There was nothing overtly out of place with her, and it could have just been happenstance nobody had elected to sit down next to her. I just couldn't shake the feeling, though, that something just fell off. Ever since I was a small child, I've always gone hunting with my father. We hunt on some property that my family owns back home in the southern part of South Carolina. We hunt mostly deer from tree stands we have set up in various locations. A front stand nearest the road, a middle stand further back through the wooded area, and the back stand, which is the last stand with a giant cornfield in front of it. We will hunt every day if we can. When I'm off, Seraph's deputy, or my dad is off, owns a company. Well, every day, that is except for Sunday. My dad has always told me that we don't hunt on Sundays. It was a Christian tradition his family had of some sort, or so I thought. One weekend I found out I had a Sunday off and I wasn't on call. And I called Daddy up to go hunting. He was immovable on his stance to not hunt on Sunday. I remember saying something like, Oh, come on. I know it's a tradition, but it's my only weekend day off. That's when he told me the other terrifying reason he won't. 
As he tells the story, the first and last time he hunted on a Sunday, he went early morning before first light. We try to get to the stands about an hour or a half before the sun comes up, as to give time for things to settle down. He says that morning, everything was quiet, and the moon lit up the dirt road he walked down to get to the tree stand. He recalls it being an eerily silent. He had to step lightly so he wouldn't make too much noise. Well, he gets to the stand when it's still pitch black dark and waits. He will swear by this next part. As first light came, just as he was barely able to make out anything, he saw two does come running out of the corner of the field. They won't run like that unless they are spooked or something is after them. As he fixes his eyes on the corner, he sees what he describes as a black figure, running on two legs and dropped down to all fours, running after the deer. He says that his feet didn't hardly touch the ladder or the ground as he flew out of the stand and ran back to the truck. What he saw, I don't know. Whatever it was, it was huge and black. Now we have no bear in this area and hardly any natural predators, much less something that big. So I have always been weary of hunting on Sunday. That does not mean that I have not had my own encounter with whatever this thing was. One morning I wanted to hunt the back stand. It is known as a hot spot for the biggest bucks to come roaming through. My dad was out of town and my cousin was at home sleeping. I decided to suck it up and walk back to the stand in the pitch black darkness. Didn't hear too much because it was raining for most of my walk. Now when you get to the back stand, you have to go through a think area of forest to reach the stand without walking through the field. The forest is lined with beer cans. You read that right? In order for us to make our way through there in the dark. Well, I began walking through the wooded area following the cans with a red lighted headlamp on. I had gotten a quarter of the way to the stand before I heard it. Two large stomps, one right after the other, crunching on the beer cans behind me. So what did I do? I ran. I ran as quickly and as swiftly as I could. And when I reached the stand, I hurled myself up as fast as my legs could take me. I called my cousin and made him stay on the phone with me. I heard those steps around me all morning until the sun rose. Exhausted from fear, my cousin came and got me and took me back to my truck. I've never went without someone else hunting the property with me since. I did not get a good look. I think part of me didn't want to know. But it was heavy and crunched the beer cans almost flat. Any ideas what we could be seeing out there? Hi, so I've had a couple encounters that have left me feeling crazy and super off. I live in central New York, which is where each of these happened. So several months ago, I'd say probably around February or March, I was at a park with one of my friends after dark. We had gone there frequently, and nothing had ever seemed weird. My friend was standing off to the side of a shed a few hundred feet away from me. I was sitting in my car. I had been zoned out looking at stuff on my phone. He had been talking on the phone with someone. It wasn't until I heard this strange barking that didn't sound human or animal-like per se. I couldn't figure out which direction it was coming from. The sound seemed to be coming from every direction. I looked up and saw my friend quickly walking down the hill before coming to a dead stop, mid-step. When I looked around, I saw out of my side mirror something stand up from all fours from behind my car and sprint off way too quickly into the surrounding woods. My friend came running to my car, getting in and locking the doors before saying, Did you see that thing? It wasn't human. It looked like it, but it was way too tall and skinny. It had ran up behind your car and then went. It was going behind your car, it squat down on all fours, and then got up and ran off. The second encounter. This happened a few months after, right around the start of spring. I was with three of my friends and one of their dads. We were in the middle of the woods at one of their campgrounds. They had gone off for a walk, probably twenty, thirty minutes ago. I had stayed back to watch the fire. Suddenly the world had gone almost silent. I almost felt like I wasn't even in our world anymore. It's hard to explain. I heard this woman screaming, No! No! Help! Someone help me! 
I had just sat there staring at the direction that I thought the noise was coming from, which was deeper in the woods. At first, I thought maybe it was one of my friends yelling, but none of them sound like that. Something had also been off about this voice. After a few minutes, it trailed off and got quieter as the world returned back to normal. My friends had returned after another 15, 20 minutes from a different direction than I heard the voice. So yeah, if anyone knows what these encounters are, or has had similar experiences, let me know. Growing up, my house was very haunted. We had a lot of negative energy and weird paranormal stuff happened, but the most memorable event was the time I saw what I believed to be a ghost. Coming across this subreddit and delving more into crawlers, I have a feeling I might have seen one rather than a ghost, but I'd like input from other people. I've been searching for years for an explanation for what I saw, and I've never found anything as close as I have here. It's unsettling to see so many people sharing similar experiences, Low. When I was around 10 years old, my friend came to stay with me while her parents were out of town. She was experiencing anxiety from being away from them and ended up crying herself to sleep. While she slept in my room, I watched TV with my mom on the couch. We both recall this in the exact same way. The lights were off in the living room with the TV providing the only light. We were both facing the TV when something caught our eye. We turned our heads, clearly seeing something run out of my room and across the living room, into the kitchen, and then disappear. It was pale and appeared to have a faint glow, but its skin was gray and sickly looking. It was bald except for random strands of wispy hair, and it was hunched over with its arms bent, running across the living room. It was super thin and you could clearly see its spine and ribcage. Its arms were skinny and bony. The only peculiar thing was it had horse-like legs, like goat, deer, or horse legs. I don't remember if it had hooves or feet, but its legs were definitely bent oddly. It was quick, but we tracked it all the way across the living room and into the kitchen. After realizing what we saw and realizing we both saw the same thing, the only logical explanation I could think of was that I saw my friend run from my room. Of course, there was literally no way I saw what I thought I saw. I felt no fear. I was actually very confident as I got up and walked into the kitchen, but I quickly got scared when I realized my friend wasn't anywhere in the kitchen. I could see her across the hall, sleeping in my bed. I've discussed it with my mom multiple times and we both recall it almost identically. I've never seen anything like it since then. I saw that they live in subterranean areas. It might be worth mentioning our house was on a sinkhole. I've also seen theories about them using portals, and I've always had a hunch that whatever I saw was moving between dimensions or portals, as it appeared from a hallway with no exterior doors and vanished around the kitchen corner. Last weekend, my five-year-old and I went tent camping in the Uintas northeast of Utah. The weather was overcast weather. By the time we got done paddleboarding, we made our way back to camp. Once we got back to camp, I couldn't shake this feeling of unease. I mostly shrugged it off, thinking I am overthinking the safety of my child. One thing to point out, there was a trailer and a truck close to us, but I never saw anyone throughout our experience from there. At around 8 p.m., we started our campfire. We roasted brats and ate snacks. During this time, I would think I heard a crack or a subtle movement and thought it was just the embers popping. Once the sun finally set, I noticed it was completely pitch black outside the reach of our campfire, light most likely due to the overcast weather. At this point, I decided it's time to pack up our food and take it to the car. But I had this sudden feeling that I was being watched, and I decided to turn my headlamp light on. I faced 30 degrees to the right of me. About 40, 50 feet from us, I see a small bush-like tree. I want to explain this small bush-like tree was not 
thick or sturdy enough for something big to lean on or climb onto, and above the tree standing behind it, I see two big circle white eyes with a hint of purple staring straight at me. The animal or creature was far enough from the glow of fire I couldn't see a silhouette of a body, but it was close enough that it was odd behavior, and it was only seconds from us if it ran towards us. My first thought was it was a bear standing on its hind legs just being curious. It looked to be eight feet tall or so. As I had my light facing the creature, who was abnormally close to our campsite, I grabbed my kiddo and bear spray and told my kid, there's a bear behind a tree, and assured him, we will be fine. This creature just watched us intently. Suddenly, a few seconds later, my intuition screamed, get out now. I then started walking backwards towards my car and told my kid to walk slowly with me. The creature made no movement and tilted its eyes on us as we moved away until my light could no longer reach it. I can't explain this new type of fear I was experiencing. It was unnatural. I think prioritizing my boy's safety allowed me to get us to the car in a much more composed manner. Once in the car, we waited 30 minutes to see if it would come into the campsite to look for food, but nothing happened. I thought perhaps it left and we could sleep in the car to be safe. I decided that I am going to try and grab blankets from the tent, put out the fire, and we can pack out first thing in the morning. I thought wrong. The campsite from the car was about 150 feet away. To the right of us were big trees, and to the left of us is tall grass or brush. I get out of the door and turn my headlamp on. My light shines towards the brush, and laying low in the brush, I see the white eyes again staring up at me. I decided to try and act big and yell out at the creature, but it made a move towards me, which in return made me jump back into the car in reverse. I tried to shine my car lights towards it and couldn't see anything. I decided to find help. I'd drive down and find a friendly fellow dad camper who is happy to help me pack things up to leave. He arrives with a much brighter flashlight in his truck. As I am packing, he sees the eyes and mentions there's two of them. He states they're not moose, deer, cougars, and if it's a bear, it's really odd behavior, and he doesn't know exactly what they are. I face towards where he is shining his light, and I see a second pair of white eyes. At this point, I am terrified. One of them is standing tall, while the other is lower. This time, they are much further back, as if they now know there's a new reach limit to the light devices being used. It wasn't until the lower set of eyes decides to stand up and be much taller, then the first one looking monstrous. This made my new friend very uneasy, and he quotes, This has got me on edge. Let's just throw everything in your car and leave. The whole time we are packing out, I would catch these creatures creating a perimeter around us. They just walked around the campground in circles waiting for something, it seemed. I tried to think of rational possible theories, but the more I think about it, the more I can't shake the feeling this could have been a skinwalker or something else. They were too smart, intuitive, bold, scary, and didn't act like normal wildlife. Any thoughts on these creatures would mean the world to me. Thank you if you read this. I was getting goosebumps retelling the story. My story is scary, and I have been reluctant to mention it over the years. A few friends and family have been told, though I doubt that any of them believe me. The girlfriend who was with me at the time was deeply affected by the encounter, so much so that she has never really been the same since. In the summer of 2016, my then-girlfriend and I were camping in the Lewis Mountain Campground, which is near Skyline Drive in the Shenandoah National Park. We had been there several times before, and we always enjoyed our time there. I set up a large tent and separate canopy. There were no other campers within 100 yards, but we could hear others in our proximity. We spent most of the daytime hiking throughout the area. The second night, a Saturday, early Sunday morning, we were fast asleep. We had been out and about all day and were very tired. I believe it was approximately 1 a.m. when we were both awoken by a crashing sound outside the tent. 
I looked out the flap but couldn't see anything, so I got up with the lantern and walked to the canopy. I noticed that the camp stove had tipped over. I assumed it was the wind or that one of the legs gave way. I shrugged it off and went back to the tent. I hadn't gone back to sleep when I heard a strange chattering sound. It reminded me of the sound a monkey makes when agitated. Once again, I looked out the tent, and this time I noticed a tall shadow standing by the canopy. I woke my girlfriend and asked her to look. She was frightened, but eventually took a look. By this time, the shadow was moving slowly around the camp and making low, deep grunts. The first thing I thought was that a black bear was looking for a meal. But I then realized that this shadow was extremely tall and walking on two legs. I grabbed a flashlight and directed it towards the shadow. When I did, this shadow quickly materialized into a huge hairy beast that lunged towards us. We both bolted back into the tent and cowered against the far side. The grunts continued as this beast walked around the tent. I tried to call for help on my phone, but the signal cut out each time it connected. We were horrified by the ordeal which continued for about ten minutes. We were afraid to scream because we feared it would attack us. Eventually, the beast left the camp, but we stayed awake the rest of the night. We packed at daylight and quickly left. I later contacted the park authorities, but they dismissed my story. I'm sure that this beast was what people call a Bigfoot. My girlfriend and I soon broke off our relationship, but she has had emotional issues since that encounter. I have bad dreams at times and have never camped since. Thanks for reading. I am a woman who goes hiking. I was on one of my regular trails and came to a fork in the road where I continue on my usual route. I'd never felt unsafe. A man around my age was there and asked if he could go the same way as me. I say yes. We talk and everything is fine until he randomly says he could overpower me at any time. Thankfully, we were near the mouth of the trail and he didn't attempt anything. I haven't gone alone since. My sisters and I were off, roading like two, three hours down a forestry road in British Columbia, Canada before we found a good spot to camp. These roads weren't on any back roads map, so it was super remote, maybe 100, 120 from the nearest farm or sign on civilization. Middle of night, we were still up at the campfire when my sister said she saw a red light in the bushes that quickly disappeared. She was pretty freaked, but we just laughed, thinking she was messing with us. Five minutes later, I spot the red light in the bush behind her. It's a video recorder light. I turned my headlamp on in the direction of the dim red light and see a man turn and run away with camera in hand. We freaked the F out, jump into the truck and drove down the narrow road without any of our camping stuff. We went back in the morning to collect. It was all still there and we surveyed a bit farther to see if there was a sort of encampment or hunting lodge. Nothing, not even a walking path off the barely visible road. To this day, I wonder how long he followed us or what his plans with these recorded videos were for. A lone human deep in the wilderness at night is hands down the most terrifying encounter. My wife and I were hiking in Sweden and three or four days into the woods out of the direction of population without seeing anybody else in days. In the middle of the night, we both woke up to the sound of footsteps, boots running even sprinting towards our tent, as clear as day. So I shot up, went outside the tent, and there was nobody there. Even searched around a bit in the pitch dark of the forest, but we were alone. Not that big of an outdoorsman, but I, I loved to fish. I was out on a lake that was electric, only so I was using my electric motor. It was very early. The sun was just starting to come up. I saw what looked like a beaver or a raccoon swimming towards me. It was far off, maybe 100, 150 yards. 
so I thought nothing of it and went back to my fishing. Five, ten minutes go by and I decide to move spots. I look back over and now about twenty, thirty feet from me was that beaver that turned out to be a black bear. I let out a scream and not a manly one. Threw on my trolling motor, which at full throttle moved me about as fast as the bear could swim. For what felt like an eternity, I was being chased by a bear in the water. It was probably only a few minutes, but it scared me enough that I keep bear spray on the boat at all times. Went biking with a buddy in a nature preserve at night when his chain broke about 15 miles from where we started. It's pitch black, except for our lighting, but nearly a full moon. We could see dozens of shapes lightly moving all around us about 20, 30 yards away as we were in sort of a clearing. That wasn't the freaky part, though. It was seeing the reflection of so many eyes staring at us from a distance that slowly crept towards. Luckily, I carried spare quick change chain links. I had never fixed a chain so fast in my life before or since. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.